In lighting our worship candle, we celebrate the risen Christ, the light of the world. The light of Christ shines in the darkness and the darkness will never put it out. And we acknowledge our first peoples. We acknowledge that this worshiping center is in country where for countless centuries, traditional communities have celebrated its religious significance of place, its plants, its living creatures, and the care of the earth, which is implanted in their law. We honor them and also delight in the sacred in our midst. We pray that we might work together for reconciliation and justice in this land, and that a spirit of friendship will bond us together and bear much fruit for God's kingdom. And our call to worship. We come to worship our God, to listen to the one who calls us here. We come to worship our God, to shout with joy to the God of all people. We come to the creator of all things, to be bathed in the waters of life. We come to the feast of God's faithful, to be fed by the one who never forsakes us. We come to worship our God, to sing aloud to the one who saves us. We now sing our first hymn, a morning hymn, a bit ironically that is sung to the melody of all through the night. <laughs> Yeah. 
Well, welcome everybody, uh, those here in our Curtin Church, those who are with us on Zoom. I see a few of you on the screen there. Welcome. And there may even be some who will be uh, watching us on YouTube uh, later on when that becomes available. It's good to see you all. It's good to be here uh, together, uh, whether it's in one place or whether it's uh, in, in the, uh, in, uh, spread out in ge geographically. Um, the, uh, this is the third Sunday in uh, Lent and our, um, the things that we'll be giving up or we'll be celebrating to give up are meanness and barrenness this morning and the things that um, we want to widen will be our vision of fruitfulness and abundance. And for those of you who've looked through the order of service, there'll be no prizes to realise that the symbols we're going to be using are going to be figs and fig trees. So welcome one and all. And now let us join in prayer. Loving and faithful God, we come into your presence rejoicing. We come to sing your praise. We come to hear your words of power. We come to share your all-embracing love. Be present with us in this time as we come together to worship you, called to be your people, called to walk the way of Jesus. We come with the offering of ourselves, seeking your words of forgiveness, comfort and challenge. And now let's share the peace. The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, be with you all. Peace. Our Lenten journey. This year, the theme of our Lenten ritual is to roll the stone off the heart. Lent is a 40-day journey of reflection and change, of letting go and leading to the marvel and transformation of Easter. The Christian story is about the transformation of all barriers which confine or imprison. Jesus never advocated a life which confined itself within safe, complacent walls. He always called people into the beyond. I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly. Long before lighthouses, maps and digital media, travellers made and used cairns to guide their journeys. This year, as we travel the Lenten path, where is the cairn guiding us? What habits, customs and traditions might we discard? What discoveries might we find? In removing a stone each week from this cairn, symbolically we remove the things that hold us back in our relationship with our God, the God residing within each of us. Each Sunday of Lent, we are focusing on words which oppose each other in our spiritual journey and try to remove those which impose negative or limiting ideas and focus on the opposites which widen our vision and lift weights off our hearts. On this third Sunday of Lent, we are focusing on removing the negatives of meanness and barrenness by widening our vision to that of fruitfulness 
and abundance. Jesus was unusual in his time. He told stories with open meanings that our imaginations can play with. We think of the many stories of the last weeks of his life as we sing, He Came Singing Change. Old Testament reading today is uh, from chapter 24 uh, of the book of Jeremiah. The Lord showed me two baskets of figs placed before the temple of the Lord. This was after King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon had taken into exile from Jerusalem King Jeconia of Judah. Together with officials, artisans and smiths, and had brought them all to Babylon. The basket had very good figs, like first ripe figs, but the other basket had very bad figs, so bad they could not be eaten. And the Lord said to me, what do you see, Jeremiah? I said, figs, the good figs, very good. The bad figs, very bad, so bad they cannot be eaten. Then the word of the Lord came to me. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, like these good figs, so I'll regard as good the exiles from Judah, whom I have sent away from this place to a land of the Chalde Chaldeans. I will set my eyes upon them for good, and I will bring them back to this land. I will build them up and not tear them down. I will plant them and not pluck them up. I will give them a heart to know that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. For they shall return to me with their whole heart. But thus says the Lord, like the bad figs that are so bad they cannot be eaten, so will I treat King Zedekiah of Judah, his officials and the remnant of Jerusalem who remain in this land, and those who lived in the land of Egypt. I will make them a horror, an evil thing, to all the kingdoms of the earth, a disgrace, a byword, a taunt, and a curse in the places where I shall drive them. And I will send sword, famine and pestilence upon them until they are utterly destroyed from the land that I gave to them and their ancestors. Now our uh, usual um, cantor for the Psalms, Brendan is taking a month off, so we're going to sing the psalm for the day, or at least a paraphrase of it, uh, which um, our pianist Helen found for us in uh, the um, the Psalms for All Seasons. It's a it's Psalm 63, and um, if you look in the Bible, it says of this psalm, it's a psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of, Jude, of Judah. Uh, now, most commentators believe that it belongs to David's wilderness years uh, before he came to the throne of Israel uh, when he was being hunted by Saul. Uh, it's, 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 uh, he's out in the dry heat of the desert 
and David's recalling not, worship, not water, but he's recalling worship, the steadfast love of God. And he says that although water and food are scarce, yes, yet his soul is satisfied as he concentrates his attention on God, who is the source of his life and the focus of his praise. So let's sing this paraphrase um, together. Nathaniel's Epiphany. When the Apostle Nathaniel first encounters Jesus and asks how Jesus knows him, the answer that Jesus has already seen Nathaniel sitting under a fig tree. Although Nathaniel had asked rhetorically whether any good thing could come out of Nazareth, Jesus recognised that there is nothing false in Nathaniel and that great things are about to be rele relieved revealed to him. Guarded and sceptical I may be, but God has given to me and me to life. Now do you see? I need to unveil my destiny. So what other place would I choose to be but in the shade of my own fig tree, thinking, praying, scroll on my knee, preparing for my epiphany? And what, you may ask, do I hope to find? Here are some aims that I've outlined. To study the wisdom others have mined. To touch the truth for which they've pined. Where seed meets sun and upward vined. Where justice and mercy intertwined. To smile at places where I've shined to grieve where I have been half blind, to work the work I've been assigned, to fall a little less behind. To you will be done, be more inclined, to thank the figs on which I've dined, to take some time to breathe and unwind, to choose more often to be kind. These are the things I hope to find. Our <clears throat> gospel reading uh, for today comes from chapter 13 of Luke. It's uh, one of those 
uh, fairly typical uh, pieces where Jesus starts by asking some rhetorical questions and then finishes with a parable. At that very time, there were some present who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. He asked them, do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, see here, for three years I've come looking for fruit on this fig tree and I still find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good, but if not, you can cut it down. I found it a little bit ironic that the last time I stood here to uh, make a reflection, it was about a, a grapevine. Uh, and this year it's about a fig tree. Um, the um, the um, pairing is not uh, intentional, it's purely the, uh, the luck of the uh, lectionary drawer. Uh, last year's um, reflection was about uh, Christ the, uh, the true vine and the um, pruning and the um, that, that was necessary to uh, bring it to, uh, to fruitfulness. Today is also about fruitfulness, but it's, uh, uh, this time it's about uh, either its absence through barrenness or its potential uh, through um, care and fertilisation. Now, the, the pairing of grapevines and fig trees runs deeply through the pages of the Old Testament. God tells the Hebrews on their trek, while they're trekking through the wilderness that he's uh, bringing them to a land of wheat and barley, uh, grapevines and fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil and honey. And that's a theme that's brought forward in many um, subsequent retellings of that story. And, and later on, uh, after they've come into this land and things start to turn a bit, uh, I'd say pear-shaped, but that's the, wrong, uh, <laughs> that's the wrong word to use. Uh, things start to turn uh, bad through fighting between the two kingdoms and invasions from foreign powers. The, the prophets uh, yearn for a time when Every man, and that, I'm sorry, that's the way it is, every man is able to dwell safely under his own fig tree and grapevine. Now I'm going to leave uh, the, uh, the grapes aside here and focus on the, on the figs. And um, what a wonderful fruit the fig is. Look at it. It's very luscious. Um, It's um, deeply enigmatic, I think, that the uh, story that Jesus told about, or no, the, the story of Jesus cursing the fig tree uh, takes place at a time, it is said, when he's entering Jerusalem, which is not the time for trees to uh, produce figs. That's because, of course, 
the Passover is in springtime when the fig tree is just starting to sprout. But we're fortunate in the southern hemisphere that uh, the time of Easter and, um, and Passover comes in autumn, which is indeed the time for fig trees to, to bear their figs. So that's something that we have up on the people of, uh, the, uh, of, of, of Palestine. And as I say, it is a wonderfully um, juicy, colourful, and I might even say, I think, slightly seductive uh, fruit. Um, and indeed, that takes us back to the very first mention of the fig tree, which is, of course, in the Garden of Eden. It's the first fruit that's actually mentioned in the Bible. I know that there are two other trees. There are two trees. There's the tree of life and the tree of uh, knowledge of good and evil. And from the tree of good and evil, um, Adam and Eve are not allowed to eat the fruit. It's popularly thought of as being an apple tree, but I am quite convinced in my imagination it's a fig tree. Um, I mean, anybody could reduce the temptation of eating an apple. But who could reduce, who could, who, I mean, could any of you uh, not fall for a beautiful, luscious, and I say seductive fig tree? So I'm sure, a fig, so I'm sure that's the thing that, that uh, Eve ate. And then, of course, close at hand after she'd eaten it, there were these wonderful <laughs> fig leaves which they could sew together to... Uh, uh, hide their unmentionable parts. <laughs> so I'm sure that uh, that sort of, you know, is, is the way things started off. And, and I think uh, um, probably it's because of, um, of this, the fig lying at the heart of humanity's first fall from grace, that the fig uh, and the fig tree have enjoyed a mixed sort of press in the Bible. Uh, they're certainly the symbol of uh, peace and prosperity, but, but the fig tree is also a symbol for Israel itself through the pages of the Old Testament for good or ill. And um, when things are very good, the fruit tree is, is the, the fig tree is, is, is providing great things, uh, but when things go bad for Israel, uh, it withers and the leaves fall off. Today's Old Testament uh, lesson, uh, which we had read for us, um, in it, Jeremiah has two baskets of figs. It, it's a, uh, both a political and a religious vision that he's providing. The basket of Good figs, somewhat surprisingly, uh, refers to a group of captives which are being taken away from Jerusalem uh, into Babylon. And the bad figs are those that stay almost loyally back in, uh, back in Jerusalem. Despite the exile of the, those that are sent off, Jeremiah foretells that one day they're going to return and enjoy a very much better life than those who have remained. The bad figs, as I say, are those who have remained and they make a very bad political alliance with the king of Egypt who sub subsequently leads them to a disastrous war against the Assyrians and later on the, um, the uh, Babylonians. Uh, that, as I say, is the, is the political side of the equation. But there's a much deeper insight into what uh, Jeremiah was saying. Through the captivity, the people who went off to Babylon would come to renew 
the covenant that they had, the, the covenant promises that they had with God in a very deep way. They would come to realise that their God was no, not some, a, a God that was uh, linked to a particular piece of land, but that, that he could be known, the, the God could be known uh, in the far parts of the, of the world. Uh, the basket of good figs uh, indicates that these were a people that were going to write a new covenant in their hearts and they would come back uh, not to worship idols anymore as the people who cast their lot with the Egyptians did. The Egyptians moved in, they brought with them their idols and the people of who, who remained uh, were, uh, were tempted and, and fell for what the Egyptians offered, but those who returned from Babylon did not. Now, of course, there's a wide range of other symbols for figs in the Bible and in the, the literature of the world. Uh, the ancient Persian poets celebrated young, romantic, innocent love uh, with the allegories of the fig tree and the writers of the, uh, the Song of Solomon borrowed those and we find them embedded in the stories of our own, uh, of our own Bible. And Jesus, of course, uh, sees the fig tree in the, as a symbol of trustworthiness for those who shelter under its branches as that poem about the epiphany of Nathaniel reminds us. And here I'm going to make a, a, a diversion from the, the biblical literature and I want to tell you about a book which I read uh, just before Christmas uh, in which one of the, the main character is in fact a fig tree. The book is called uh, the Island of Missing Trees, and it's by a, uh, a Tur uh, uh, an Anglo-Turkish lady writer called Elif Shafak. The, the, the book is set in two places. It's set in London. It moves between London and it moves between the island of Cyprus, and it moves through time between the early 1970s when lots of conflict is going on in Cyprus and the, the early years of our current century uh, between 2000 right up to almost the current day because the book was just published last year. It, it's a story about um, two teenage lovers, Kostas who is a Christian Greek boy, and um, Daphne, who is a Muslim Turkish girl. And in the early 1970s, when uh, ethnic and religious conflict is erupting in Cyprus, they meet clandestinely uh, in a tavern in Nicosia, the, the principal city of, of Cyprus. This, this, um, this um, tavern is run by two gay men, one of whom is Greek and the other one is Turkish. And the tavern is called the Happy Fig because it's set in the, uh, underneath it's, and, and surrounds a, a huge old fig tree that's been growing there for about 150 years. Uh, in happier days, uh, there was lots of good eating and drinking and singing and dancing that took place, arguments taking place, uh, uh, and of course clandestine lovemaking. Um, our fig tree tells a lot of the stories. Uh, she, and I will say advisedly she, because she's a, it's, a, it's a story as to why fig trees are feminine, or most of them are, uh, our fig tree tells the story, uh, she's opinionated, uh, she's impish, 
and she tells the story of the deep subterranean world of the roots in which she grows, uh, the diversity of the insects which come and live in her leaves, and of the noises and the textures of the and the vulnerability of the ecosystem, uh, particularly the humanity with which uh, she is surrounded uh, as the, uh, as in the tavern life. Now, all this starts to fall apart uh, with the partition of Cyprus that takes place when the Turks invade and the, Greekish, the Greek colonels um, counter-invade uh, in 1974. Terrorist hooligans uh, destroy the tavern and the two young lovers are separated. Costas, the, the Greek boy, has an enforced exile in London and the love affair turns sour. Costas, um, over the next 25 years, is living in London and he becomes an amateur botanist, uh, but one that is um, um, academically well respected. And in the early years of the 2000s, he returns to Cyprus ostensibly to help reforest the island, which has been decimated. But in, in his heart, he's trying to uh, find his past lover, Daphne. And of course, the inevitable happens, as you can imagine, Costas and Daphne are reunited but not without a lot of tension because they've been separated for 25 years and they've become quite different people over that time. But, but not, that notwithstanding, uh, they get together and they resettle back in London where they have a daughter called Ada. And quite a lot of the novel is actually about Ada uh, when the novel starts, she's, a, she's an emotionally mixed up 16-year-old girl uh, and uh, the novel, uh, her mother has just, her mother Daphne has just recently died and she's having a great deal of difficulty trying to understand her Cypriot father. Uh, she's a thoroughly British girl and uh, it's, she just feels that her background has all been mix, mixed up. And the reason for this is that before Costas and Daphne left Nicosia, they had visited the site of the old tavern where the fig tree, this 150-year-old fig tree, was dying because of what had been going on there. Uh, but... Before they left, Costas takes a, um, a cutting from the tree and he surreptitiously smuggles it back to London and plants it in his backyard. And for the 16 years, he's been tending the cutting, which has grown into a sapling and at 60, it, it's a, an environment which is not conducive to fig trees and it has not yet borne fruit. And Ada simply cannot understand what's going on. When the novel ends, the fig tree is just being resurrected after a very rough winter of hibernation and spring is coming and we are left not knowing what's going to happen. Now, I apologise for this long diversion, but as I prepared for my reflection today, I could not get this book out of my mind. In fact, so much so that I sat down and reread it again. I didn't, I, I, I must admit, I just bought this last week because I, I, I did the reading on, uh, uh, you know, on my, uh, on, on a tablet. Uh, it, it's a book about innocent love, 
Um, and uh, it's, an int it's, it's a book about covenant covenanting with your own uh, religious and ethnic traditions and the crises that happen when those traditions start to break down. It's a book about exile and the problem of an exile coming back. Uh, an exile who's done extremely well in his exile and coming back to a community that is in ruins. Uh, it's, it's a story about that sort of chasm that develops. It's a story about the hidden life of trees. I don't know if you remember a service that Joan Palmer took here last year where she talked about the hidden life of trees and everything that goes on in the root zones. And it's, a, it's a book all about that sort of thing. But it's also a book about death and resurrection and a future which remains totally open, which we don't really know what's going to happen in that future. And that leads me on to our gospel reading. A crowd is talking with Jesus and talking about two disasters. One of them is a natural disaster where a tower falls down and kills a number of people. The other disaster is a political murder which has taken place which grossly compromises the religious sensitivities of people. Now, Jesus says that neither of these is a judgment from God. Uh, the innocents who died can't be blamed for what went on. But he said, nevertheless, we should all take stock of this, turn around, we should repent, which means turn our lives around, to take preventative action so that these things won't happen to us if, in fact, these sorts of disasters happen again. I think there's an awful lot that we can learn about that sort of thing with respect to some of the natural and political disasters that are going on today. But Jesus then tells a parable. Uh, the owner of a vineyard has planted a fig tree which hasn't come to much. The owner tells the foreman uh, of the vineyard to cut it down. Uh, however, the foreman suggests to the owner that he should put off the decision for a year so that he can dig around the tree and put manure on it. Uh, and the foreman then goes on to say, well, if the fig tree bears fruit next year, well and good. Uh, but if it doesn't, then cut it down. And that's the parable. That's all. Uh, nothing more. Any link that what that means with the story of the, of the natural and political disasters is for us to determine. Uh, Jesus doesn't go on to, to say what it is. It, it, it's, it's, uh, and I, I think, I think uh, this is one of the wonderful things about a lot of the parables of Jesus. They're completely open. They're for us to make of what we, we want to make of. And that's about a good book too, a good book uh, leaves it open for us to make of it our own to interpret the situations in which we find ourselves. So much of this content is open for us. We don't, we, uh, we don't know um, um, why the fig tree was planted in the, in the, in the vineyard. Uh, we aren't told anything about the master and the, and the, uh, the foreman. We don't even know whether uh, the master took, took the advice seriously. And if he did, we don't even know whether the fig tree uh, bore fruit or whether it was cut down. Uh, now, I can't tell you the answers for those things, though some of the people that I referred, that I looked up found all sorts of inferences for many of those questions. But um, 
I would like to at least think that um, for me, uh, there, there is a, an openness there that the future is ours to make what we care to make of it. Um, that seemed to be the, the view of the caretaker. He says, if I put fertiliser on it and I cultivate it, I create the opportunity for a future. I don't know what that future will be. It may bear fruit, it may not bear fruit, but I've created an open opportunity. That, I think, is, the, is what Costas was doing. He took a cutting from a tree that was dying in Cyprus. He planted it in a very unfriendly environment in London. He tended it very carefully over 16 years. He didn't know what his future would be, but he knew that that future was open. In a few minutes, we're going to be singing a hymn. That hymn is, God gives us a future, daring us to go into dreams and dangers of a path unknown. I think that's a wonderful hymn about an open future that we can make for ourselves. I think Jesus, I never, never like to say what I think Jesus meant by some of these things, but I think what Jesus might have meant when he said that we need to repent when bad things happen, to turn around, not to look backwards, but to look forwards to the future even though that pathway may be unknown. And that's anyway the thought that the parable leaves with me. Now, one final observation, this is a sort of quite unrelated. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, when Willa talked about a place at the table, she finished by saying, right at the end, something happened to her. Edith had given her a story about another painting which Willa didn't know anything about and sort of two days later she made a discovery. I had sort of thought most of this out a couple of weeks ago and I went out and sat in the car out there in the parking lot and I looked up and there I saw in the grounds of the Woden Valley Uniting Church a fig tree growing. A beautiful fig tree. I didn't have any idea it was there and I ask you as you go out, just turn to the left there and you'll see this beautiful young, fruit, young fig tree growing. I made a few inquiries and was told that when Rachel Kronberger was ministering here, you plant, or we planted, <laughs> the people who were at the church there planted two, two trees, an olive tree and a fig tree as symbols of hope. And... I ponder now as to what's going to happen to that fig tree. It hasn't borne any fruit yet. It looks to me as though it's about four or five years old. Will it remain barren or will it be fertilised and will it be cultivated and bear much fruit? And I think that's probably a parable that we can say for our own venture of joining together. Uh, what is our open future? Uh, we certainly, I wouldn't like to suggest that we've come from a barren past, but I do think that we come to a point where we're making an open future for ourselves.
now's the time it's open for us to make any comments. If anyone has any reflections of their own about the readings uh, or my garbled thoughts, or, or indeed any thoughts about figs and fig trees and uh, the sea. I might, might say that those green figs came from our tree, which, uh, because of the coldness, just refuses to uh, bear f to come to any fruition. Whereas the the, the beautiful beautiful figs there. I mean, they, they were grown in Garran, but these other beautiful fig trees were uh, figs were grown here in Curtin with some friends of ours who live just around the corner. Uh, so there you go. <laughs> Any other thoughts or observations? Thank you for, for telling us about the fig tree outside. I yes. must not have been here. I mean, I'm not, I was here when Rachel was here. I have no memory of, of that, so I'm going to have to go out and, uh, and see our fig tree. It's a lovely little tree, yeah. and it's just growing beside just, the uh, little library that's there. <laughs> yes, yes, I think we'd better go out and cultivate and put some manure on it. Otherwise, I might, somebody might come with an axe next year and chop it down. <laughs> it's been a funny year for, fig, for fruit. I mean, lots of fruit has formed, but it's been so cold and rainy that a lot of fruit hasn't really formed, hasn't uh, come to the sort of perfection that we'd like it to do. I might say that the... That the um, that the, um, there's quite a bounty of the figs and they'll be cut up afterwards and you'll be able to share them. Okay, let's move into our time of uh, prayers for the people. The response I'd ask you to give to each of these prayers is when I say this is my prayer if you could respond this is our prayer loving God as we pray for our world we remember the words of the psalmist God is our refuge and strength a very present help in trouble Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be moved and though the mountains are shaken. In the midst of the sea, though the waters rage and foam, and though the mountains quake at the rising of the sea. We are confronted with a broken and divided world, with ongoing conflicts in the Middle East, Africa and Asia, and now the horrendous violence and destruction of the invasion of Ukraine. We pray for all people caught up in these situations and also for the many trying to escape. May they be assisted with compassion and generosity. This is my prayer. We pray for the leaders of the world, the presidents, politicians, judges, diplomats, negotiators, and all who have responsibility and authority. Give them wisdom and moral strength as they work together to resolve the seemingly insoluble, that there may be peace in all the world. This is my prayer. We pray for our own country as it copes with its natural disasters and climate change. We give thanks for the selfless assistance provided by emergency workers and volunteers, health professionals and friends and neighbours. We pray for the victims and for those who have lost loved ones in the floods. We pray that our elected representatives have the wisdom and judgment to take heed of scientific advice and to put the welfare of the country ahead of political ambition. This is my prayer. We pray for ourselves and our community. We give thanks for the love and fellowship we enjoy in our church and also in our daily lives. We give thanks for our families and friends. 
May we always share the spirit of love as taught by Jesus Christ. This is my prayer. This is our prayer. We give thanks for the care, patience and wisdom of our doctors, nurses and all who work with them as they tend those in need, particularly as the COVID virus continues to spread. We pray for all who are ill, frail and suffering in body or mind, especially those known to us. This is my prayer. Let us go forward with a spirit of hope and optimism and with faith that God is indeed our refuge and strength. Amen. Let us say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We, of course, will not be taking up a collection. I don't know when that process is going to start again, but uh, uh, we, there will be a bowl, I think, on the table there if anyone would like to make a contribution. But we acknowledge that there are many generous givers of money, time and services that make a difference to the members of this, our local faith community, and to the wider world that God calls us to serve. We are grateful for these gifts, freely given, and pray for the wisdom to know how best to build on them and share them so that they will bear great fruits for God's kingdom and the renewal of the whole creation. Amen. And we're now going to sing that hymn, God Gives Us a Future, I'm, I'm going to say that I've taken the liberty of changing the opening words of the second verse. In the uh, written hymn, it start, that second verse starts, We must leave behind us sins of yesterday. Now, we must leave behind us sins. I'm not challenging that. But I think that particularly for a community like us, uh, a lot of the things we've got to leave away are going to be good things. They're going to be things that we've relied on in the past that have been very fruitful, but they, we mustn't make the claims of those things hold us back. And I think the hardest things to give up are not necessarily the bad things. I think the hardest things to give up are the good things. So I don't know whether claims is the right word, but I think sins is probably the wrong one.
Philippians. Go joyfully upon your way, knowing that God is near. Go gently, go lightly, go safe in the spirit. Go knowing that God heeds all our anxious thoughts and that with thanksgiving we can make our requests known to God in prayer. And may the peace of God, which passes understanding, keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, now and always. Amen. Amen.